Amen. Amen. You guys excited? You guys excited? So good. Thank you guys. It's amazing. I'm going to get right into it. I have a lot on my heart, and I am praying that I have enough time to share it all with you. So start praying now. I'm very honored to be able to speak to you guys this morning, and um, just thank the pastors for giving me this amazing opportunity. And uh, just good to be with you guys. It's good to see you guys from this perspective and not just give announcements, but, but share what's on my heart. And I uh, just feel like God's doing so much in this season. Actually, when I got to the church, the Lord started showing me things, and I saw a picture of a sword, and the sword was hanging on the wall, and it was pretty, but it had dust on it. And I felt like the Lord said, uh, too many swords are collecting dust. And he spoke to me and he said, I'm not talking about this physical sword. I'm talking about the word of God. And I'm teaching the body of Christ that we need to learn how to wield our swords. Because if you were given a sword, it's say, say when you're a teenager and your parent gave you a, a physical sword and you lived in that time period, it was important for you to know how to use that sword. If you just kept it in your room and, and hung it on the wall and looked at it from time to time, well, when time comes to use it, you're not going to know what you're doing. True? It's going to look pretty. It's going to look good. It's going to look shiny. But I feel like God is saying we're living in a time that we have to know how to wield our swords. I also feel like it's saying it's not too late. Don't disqualify yourself. Before I even start, I just want to come against the lies of, I don't like to read or I'm not a reader. Well, become one. Start somewhere. Listen to the audio Bible. Fill yourself with the word of God in some way. Because I promise you, we're in, it's not a day is coming, we're in the times where we need to know what we have access to and who we have access to. So I'm excited to share this morning. Um, I'm going to be reading out of Judges chapter 6 and 7, talking about my boy Gideon. And uh, the Lord put Gideon on my heart a few weeks ago and uh, challenged me to just start researching and reading. So I've read the stories through a lot of different translations, and I'm just excited to show you some things that the Lord was showing me. I'm going to read a lot. I'll probably paraphrase a lot, and I'm just going to share my heart. Is that okay? I'm excited. God, open up our ears to hear and our eyes to see. Holy Spirit, equip me with your presence. God, manifest your peace so I can articulate everything that is burning on my heart. Amen? Amen. I can feel the weightiness of this word, but I'm excited to release it. So we're just going to start off in uh, chapter 6 and just read, The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, martyrs from Midian and Amalek and the people of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying crops as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. These enemy hordes coming with their livestock and tents were as thick as locusts. They arrived on droves of camels, too numerous to count, and they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord God for help. Let's focus on verse 6. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then, everyone say then, the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. They cried out to the Lord because of Midian. Do we find ourselves crying out to God only when we are in a place of starvation? Or only when we want to see a shift in politics? Do we find ourselves crying out to God? If you feast on the things of the Lord on a daily basis, guess what? You won't find yourself in a place of starvation. Psalms 34.10 says, Those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. We don't have to be in a place of starvation. We can have a relationship with Jesus that looks like Whatever the circumstance looks like, like Pastor Dave said, no matter if the car is working or not, is my heart positioned to have that relationship with God? Let's continue reading. Verse 8. Verse 7. When they cried out 
to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. He said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am the Lord, your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in, those, in, the, in the land that you now live, but you have not listened to me but you have not listened to me. I I love the fact that God is patient with the Israelites. That when they cried out, he chose to respond. He chose to speak. The prophet reminds the Israelites how God has rescued them over and over. And he also reminds them that he commanded them not to worship other gods. This shows us that the stories and testimonies of others are not enough to sustain our own relationship and trust in God. Because they heard the stories. They knew what God did for their relatives, but it wasn't personal for them. It hadn't become their personal walk with the Lord. So they were so quick to turn their eyes off of Jesus and, and turn to the latest and greatest thing. We as children of God need to cultivate and develop a relationship with God. You have to ask yourself, what does my personal relationship with God look like? Is it in a healthy place? Only you know the answer to that question. I can't answer that question for you. It's really easy to come together and say the right things, do the right things. But at the end of the day, we're not cultivating a real developing relationship with God where we're even open to conviction, Where God comes and he speaks, but as we're going to continue reading, they didn't like what he has to say. We have to have a perspective. Who loves the book of James? I love James because it's it's sharp. It's sharp. James 1, 2 says, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Not for like a little joy, for great joy. Consider this an opportunity that the Lord is stretching me. The Lord is putting me in a position where I'm going to grow and my endurance is going to grow and good's going to come out of this. What if we have that perspective? What if the Israelites had that perspective? My goodness. Verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah which belonged to Joash in the clan of Abiezar, Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of the winepress to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. In his place of fear, the pro- like he's being called out, his destiny is being called forth. The angel of the Lord comes to Gideon and prophesies his destiny. The angel calls him a mighty hero and declares that the Lord is with him. A lot of us are familiar with this story, but what is Gideon's response? He says, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Because the story started off because the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. Freedom will not manifest in your life until you are willing to confront the sin that you are willfully choosing to partner with. And that's a now word. That's not just a word for the Israelites. This isn't just revelation for the past. This is now. Tangible freedom will not manifest in all of your circumstances, in your family, if you refuse to confront the things that are holding you back from your relationship with the good heavenly father. Notice that Gideon's response, Gideon doesn't even acknowledge that the Israelites had been actively worshiping false gods. His first response was, yeah, but if if God is good and God is with me, then why is all this bad stuff happening? Because you've been worshiping false gods. He doesn't humble himself and say, wow, you know, you're, you're right. We've been doing this the wrong way. He makes it about himself but what about us? Why have we been dealing with this stuff? He only sees the fruit that their sin is producing, but up until this moment wasn't willing to tear down the altars that they built out of rebellion. Up until this moment, the angel of the Lord is about to expose the altars that have to come crashing down to move forward. I 
And I love the angel of the Lord's response to Gideon was, go and rescue, rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. His response is still, I'm sending you. His response is still, I'm equipping you. I'm giving you everything you need. Is doubt holding you back from fulfilling the call of God that has already been placed on your life? The call of God has already been placed on your life, but doubt is holding you back from stepping into it. Doubt is holding you back from believing that you can do it, but you can't do it if he's not upon you. You can't do it through your strength, but through his strength, you can do all things. It's amazing to be able to read a story and think you know what it's saying, but then read it a little closer. Spend a little more time. Pop out another translation. Get a little more in depth. And we've, we're just started. We're only a few verses in. The moment the angel of the Lord declared, mighty hero, the Lord is with you, Gideon was equipped to fulfill the call that God has placed on his life. The moment the word was spoken, we cannot allow doubt to rob us of our callings. Knowing that God is with you is all the confidence that you will ever need. Like, do you wake up in the morning and know that God is with me? Catch this. He's not just with you. He's in you. He's not just upon you. He's dwelling inside. And if we had that type of real developing relationship with God, I think we'd be, we would be using our swords a little bit more. I think we would realize the amount of authority that we have and we would be allowing him to use us and us be his mouthpiece to declare the word of God over our nation, over our families, over our cities, over our workplaces. And we would have a confidence because you'll see as this story progresses, a confidence comes, but it's still, God, if this is what you're saying, show me, show me, show me. And to praise God that God's patient. Praise God that he's not patient. He's like, what, you want another sign? Another sign? Like, I don't want to get ahead of myself. <laughs> well, I'll paraphrase a little bit. So Gideon is trying to wrap his mind around this reality. He's like, you're really calling me to do this? I'm the least of the least. Why? Like, it doesn't make sense. Well, let me tell you, God's going to come to you and ask you to do things that doesn't make sense, that you don't feel equipped to do, that you don't feel like you can do it, because it takes you getting low and being dependent upon the Holy Spirit to work through you. Just a little bit of a rabbit trail. What's really been on my heart is you'll see if, if you're on social media, which it's a blessing and sometimes definitely a curse, but you'll see a lot of things being posted about purity and holiness. I'm here to tell you that's not just a popular charismatic season of purity and holiness talk. That's where the church needs to be and live. We're where we are with some things because we are not, as a whole, as a global church, walking in purity and holiness. But it gets exciting to talk about it for, your, for a few weeks. But then when the convictions come, God comes to us and says, hey, there's these altars you need to rip down. Are you willing to rip them down to do what you're called to do? Oh, I don't like that. That's uncomfortable. That's uncomfortable. The enemy, enemy will say, oh, that's condemnation. Don't partner with that. No, conviction's holy. Conviction is, Lord, ser search me, O oh Lord. If there's anything in me that has come into me and I didn't even realize is here, purge me of it. I want to only say what the Father is saying. I, I only want to do what the Father is doing. That's in everything. That's in every day of life. That's Monday through Sunday. God, search me. Do we have that trust in him that says, when we say search me, well, he's going to start exposing things if that's your prayer. Because we can never take ourselves off the potter's wheel. We never get to a point where we say, well, I'm good. The moment you say you're good, you're done. He's the potter. We're the clay. He's the one that smooths out the cracks that we don't even realize we have. He's the one that smooths out that attitude. We worship God on Sunday, disrespect our wife in the afternoon, yell at our kids say really inappropriate stuff on social media about other political views that you don't agree with. I'm telling you, he's purging the church. 
and it ain't going to be comfortable. And I'm not up here to perform for you. I'm, it's my calling to preach the word and truth of the Lord. And sometimes, most of the time, all the time, it should convict. Because guess what? It convicts me. There's times where I type and I'm like, mm, I can't say that. That's me. That's me speaking. I want to comment, but I can't. I want to like that, but I'm not going to, because if I like it, people will say, oh, Pastor Matt liked it, so it's okay for me to like it. Pastor Matt shared it, so it must be okay. No, it's not. It's not okay. We need to stop making excuses for it. Whatever happened to pray for your enemies and those who persecute you? How many of us have been on our knees praying for Governor Wolf? How many of us have been on our knees praying for Dr. Levine, for the Lord to expose the truth of the gospel to them and they get set free because for their soul, for their soul, not so you don't have to wear a mask, for their soul to be right with the Lord. God, break me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Let injustices frustrate me. Let me use my voice to bring life and life abundantly. Let me, let me refuse to partner with the ways the world combats. Let me sign off when I need to sign off. Let me get my face in this word. Let me realize who I am because if, my, if I'm not on my knees praying, but I can share a gif or a meme that's super disrespectful and super hateful and then call myself a Christian and say everything's okay. I'm deceived. You're deceived. And you don't know you're deceived because guess what? That's deception. But I'll tell you what, the angel of the Lord is in the place exposing altars that need to come crumbling down. Altars of impatience. Altars of, I'm building this altar out of impatience because God, you're not moving quickly for me, so I'm going to do it my own way. Guess what? That's an altar that needs to come down. Oh, but that's not righteous. Okay, what, what battle are you fighting? A lot of us are just being so distracted by what's happening that we're not on our knees where we're supposed to be. Praying and interceding and declaring the truth of the gospel over our nation. If my people pray. If my people pray. If my people pray. Not comment, not post, not share, not complain. If my people pray, healing will come to our land. But let me guess, healing hasn't come yet. <laughs> Maybe we're not praying enough. And I'm speaking to myself. You're sleeping. You're in a good deep sleep. You wake up 3 a.m. You're like, oh, man. My bed feels good. I got time. I can sleep some more. Maybe that's God reeling you in to pray. I don't know what to pray. Speak in tongues. You don't know what you're praying for. You could be interceding for something directly that's happening here and now that you don't even realize what you're praying. Hmm. While the angel of the Lord assured Gideon of his presence with him, Gideon felt that the Lord had forsaken the Israelites in view of their present circumstance. So Gideon goes and he gets a sacrifice and he brings it to the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord takes his staff touches it, it consumes it with fire, disappears. Crazy stuff's happening. Crazy stuff's happening, man. Like we read the Bible like it's boring. That's crazy. Like, I mean, this the sacrifice was just erupted with fire. He disappears, he comes back. Like this is, this is insane. And Gideon's still like, is this you? <laughs> but so how many of us need a sign? We ask for a sign, he gives us a sign. And we're like, give me another one. <laughs> you really want me to do that? Yeah, my mind hasn't changed. But God's patient with us. He gives us a sign out of his patience. I don't want to get sidetracked. We've got a lot to cover. He rejoiced when the sacrifice was taken because this is what he needed to, to see for him to realize that he was having a face-to-face -face encounter. Then the Lord said to him, peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Gideon builds an altar there to the Lord and called it, the Lord is peace. Gideon's relationship with the Lord is going from not trusting him to now shalom peace. I trust what he's saying. He's my comfort. There's a shift happening. Gideon's new sense of security in his relationship with the Lord is effectively expressed by the term shalom. 
because the shalom means wholeness, security, well-being, prosperity, peace, and friendship. He's now establishing a friendship with God. It's not just a story. It's not just someone else's relationship with God. Your relative's relationship with God will not sustain you through times that we're in and times that will come. You have to have your own thriving, developing relationship with him, with the Prince of Peace. So good. Uh, Verse 25. That night the Lord said to Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old, pull down your father's altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. Then build an altar to the Lord your God here on the hilltop sanctuary, laying the stones carefully. Sacrifice the bull as a burnt offering on the altar, using as fuel the wood of the Asherah pole. Nice. Use that sucker to let that sucker burn, and you cut it down. Verse 27. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord had commanded. But he did it at night because he was afraid of the other members of his father's household and the people of the town. Let's pause. What did the Lord say to Gideon? Fear not. What did Gideon do? Fear. Maybe he had a trust that in the long run we were going to win, but he had fear of man still in his heart that are still dictating his decisions. He waited till morning No, he did it at night because he didn't want people to see. He didn't want people to see what was going down. What altars have you built in your life that God is asking you to tear down? Not in secret. Not so no one else can see. No, he wants you to have a relationship with him where he exposes things and your whole family sees it burn down. Your whole family sees something's different. They threw away all those CDs. They got rid of all those, that music that they used to listen to. They don't cuss anymore. They actually told me, God's working in my heart, and I want to apologize because I've been really judgmental the last six years, and forgive me. God's showing me things about myself that need to come crumbling down. Then what happens? Freedom comes. Freedom manifests because we're actually willing to allow the exposure that's happening inside of us. We're not, we're not embarrassed by it. Family members aren't going to understand. How many times a week you go to church? What do you want to do? What trip you want to go on? Man, you're always doing something at the church. Yeah, I love Jesus. I love him. I want to serve him. We're not supposed to do it in secret. Because what if, what if the whole town, the whole community saw what was happening? Maybe there would have been a grace for them to step into it. This gets me. The Israelites cry out to the Lord for help. Sends a prophet, sends the angel of the Lord, tells Gideon to tear down these altars. They do it. Now what do they want to do? They want to kill Gideon. They wake up. They realize that the altars that they've built out of rebellion are tore down. This is crazy. (laughs) It's time to take a stand for holiness and purity and refuse to make choices that are rooted in the fear of man. Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and discipline. If you despise discipline, you're a fool. If a leader that you say you love and trust comes to you and says, hey, I kind of see something in your life that you may not see, but you refuse to accept it, the Bible's telling, calling you a fool, not Pastor Matt. But if we can't even humbly go to the Lord and allow him to be the one that corrects us, allow correction to be a normal thing because it's okay for us to be corrected but it's what we do with that correction because God will tell you God will speak and he'll he'll say do you really want freedom because if you really want freedom you got to tear the stuff down if you really want freedom instead of you putting space between you and your wife you have to actually confront the dysfunction for you to have a healthy marriage you actually have to do something about it for you to not have unforgiveness in your life, you have to ask yourself, do I carry any amount of unforgiveness towards anyone? Because at the end of the day, it's only hurting you. It's robbing you of your joy. It's robbing you of your peace. 
We live in a culture where the truth of the gospel isn't popular, but will you be willing to tear down altars that you may have built out of that impatience and rebellion? Will you be the one to stand up and say this isn't right? Because it was the people that came after Gideon. It was a church vote. It was the sons and daughters of God that should have known they were the sons and daughters of God, but they're deceived. They're walking in, obviously, deception. Oh, but I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I don't gossip as much as Sally. I gossip, but I don't gossip as much as Sally. Sally's deceived. No, you're deceived. Because now we're comparing ourselves with how much we do that's dysfunctional. That's dysfunctional. <laughs> I'm just saying that we're in a time where God is revealing things to us and we have to respond. You, the Lord poking on things in your life and showing you things that need to change, that anger that you keep saying that you have, the anger that you say, oh, well, I'm just an angry person. Well, no, you're, yeah, you're prophesying that reality over your life every time you say it. I'm just depressed. I'm just anxious. You're creating that world for yourself. Confront it. Look in the mirror and say, why am I so miserable? Why does my life, why is my life bad? Why, do, why am I always sad? When you start confronting those things, guess what the Lord's going to do? Hi. <laughs> Ready to go tear some stuff down? Burn it? Actually use that fear to light it on fire? Use that thing that deceived you to light it on fire? Unashamedly? Right when he says... When God tells you to fear not, you won't die. Don't fear that you're going to die. Truly believe in him. Truly have faith. Hmm. Verse 33, let's jump a little bit because I still got a bunch to say. Okay, so Gideon kind of knows what's up. He knows what he's called to do. Altars have been torn down. People are ticked. They want to literally kill him. That's where we're at. <laughs> verse 33 soon afterward the armies of Midian and Amalek and the people of the east formed an alliance against Israel and crossed the Jordan camping in the valley of Jezreel then the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon with power he blew a ram's horn as a call to arms and the men of the clan of a whole bunch of people started coming together Pastor Matt's paraphrase whole bunch of people started coming together big armies being developed a lot of people are getting it. They're like, wow, something's on this. Gideon is clothed with power. Something has shifted. The Spirit of God is with Gideon. Let's listen. What does he need? What does he want? Let's go after it. Passion starting to arise. It literally translates that the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon with power. Do you wake up in the morning and allow the Holy Spirit to clothe you with power? I want to have that kind of relationship with God that I know that I'm equipped to do what he calls me to do. I'm not doing this up here by my own strength. You ask my wife. You ask the people that really know me, man. I'm, I'm pacing. I'm like, oh gosh, what am I going to say? I'm nervous. And all of a sudden I come up here clothed with power. Because I'm not doing this by my own strength. I'm not giving you Matt Smith's opinion. I'm giving you the word of God. I want to be around people that are clothed with power, that know that they're clothed with power, that don't have to take it on and off. Because we're not just clothed. He indwell, he's dwelling inside of us. That's the reality that we get to live in. The Spirit of the Lord clothed himself with Gideon, which, which literally means he took possession of Gideon. Allow the Holy Spirit to take possession of you. Gideon blows a ram's horn. Men from surrounding regions begin to gather. I love what God says. He's like, yeah, you have too many people. Too many. Too many people. I literally, he lays it out so plain. He's like, yeah, if I let you do this, the Israelites, they're just going to tell them, they're going to boast about it to me. <laughs> God is helping them. God is intervening in their situation. And he's like, yeah, I know if I let you do this, they're going to boast. They're going to take the accolades. They're not going to know that it was me rescuing them because you couldn't do anything without me, but they don't know that. Gosh, he's so patient. I see his patience and kindness in this story. Because Gideon's still in a place of, Lord, is this you? He does the whole fleece thing. I'm going to put the fleece out. It's wet. I'm going to put it out. It's dry. And God does it. 
He does it. Because Gideon wants the, uh, the assurance that the power that he's, that he's feeling and he's experiencing is actually going to go with him in the heat of battle. He's in that tension. He knows God's there, but he just wants that assurance. And I know all of us, none of us have been in that position where God tells us to do something over and over again. And we're like, God, is it really you? He gives you another dream. Yep. Run into someone, they say, hey, I just really feel like you're supposed to do this, this thing. You're like, oh, God, I need a sign. God, I need you to speak. You open up your Bible randomly. It's exactly what you need to read. I'm just saying. So the Lord says to Gideon, you have too many warriors with you. We go through that, okay? Tell whoever is timid and afraid to go home. Go home. I'm telling you, God is saying to the church, whoever is timid and afraid, go home. You don't belong on the battlefield. There's no easy way to say that. This, I feel like the Spirit of God is saying... Whoever is timid and afraid, get. 22,000 men left. Leaving him with 10,000 to fight with. He says, still too many. Keep this in mind. The army, their camels outnumber sand. <laughs> He's like, what do you mean 10,000 is too many? 10,000 is too many. Takes him down to the water. Whoever sips the water, whoever drinks it like dogs, whoever gets down, drinks it with their mouth, straight from the stream. Cool. 300. I want the 300. I want to put you in a position where only the people around you know that this is me. This is me. He's setting them up. He's setting them up. You can't afford to let fear grip you in such a way that disqualifies you off the battlefield. If you let fear come into your life, make its home in you, the moment the Lord says, if, if there's any, look, if there's any fear, just go. Even if he's nice about it, just go. Oh, this is the Lord being gracious with me. This is my season of just being on my lazy boy and looking at my sword on the wall. Wrong. Wrong. We're the body of Christ. We're the body of Christ. We all need each other walking in this realness. I don't care how young you are. I don't care how old you are. All of us have a sword to wield. All, he wants all of us on the battlefield. Even though he promises us victory. Oh, we're going to win anyway. I'm going to stay home this Sunday. They're going to encounter God. They're going to go on that outreach, and it's going to be great. They have this person going, this person. Oh, my gosh, they don't need me. I'm just going to, you're disqualifying yourself. We can't make any decisions out of a place of fear. If you make decisions that are based on fear, you are making fear your God. Guess what? Altar time, chopping time, burning time. Have you literally made fear an altar in your life? Where everything you do goes through the filter of, I don't know, am I... I don't know, I'm scared, I don't know. I, I, most of the things I do, I'm frightened. <laughs> but then you, have, you just have to choose and say, you know what, God, you're calling me to do this. I know I'm called to do this. I know you've equipped me. I know that you said, Matt, for such a time as this, mighty man of valor. He called me a mighty man, I'm a hero, before I do a dang thing. But if I know that, that's what's gonna get me on the battlefield. That's what's gonna get you on the battlefield. It's if you truly believe what he says. Judges 7.7, 7, the Lord tells Gideon, with these 300 men, I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. I will. I love that. I will. So good. I love it. And they're getting ready. They have the 300 men. The other armies are gathering together. I don't know. I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan. Anybody else? It's just me. Geek. Wow. Cool. Babe, raise your hand. Cool. Thanks the scenes of like the armies and it's like thousands of like, you know, evil armies. Like, and I see like Gideon, like looking like, oh my goodness. <laughs> what? And I love how God is so patient. He knows Gideon. God knows, do you trust that God knows you? He knows how you think. He knows to the point of it's about to be battle time, battle time ready. Gideon has had sign after sign after sign after sign. Here's your sign to do what I've called you to do. But yet God wakes him up and says, hey, hey buddy, just in case you're struggling with a little bit. He knows he's struggling. Just 
just in case you're a little timid, you're a little afraid, the Lord said, get up. Go down into the Midianite camp, for I have given you victory over them. But if you're afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant. Listen to what the Midianites are saying, and you will be greatly encouraged. The enemy's about to encourage you, boy. <laughs> Who's going to encourage you? The enemy. Love it. Then you'll be eager to attack. <laughs> the enemy can't. They're having dreams. They're having dreams. Could you just get this picture of Gideon just inching up, getting close enough that he can hear them speaking, and he hears the enemy having dreams, and then the interpretation of that dream is, man, surely Gideon and the Israelites, they're going to win. They're going to win. He's like, Fuck. notice that. He's not even noticing the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of warriors that are about to attack his 300. Some of you need to know that when the enemy's speaking, he says, man, we're, we're conquered. We're defeated. We're under their feet. We're under their feet. Like the enemy, that's the kind of conversation they're having. Their conversation isn't like, well, guys, we might win. No, they know they're going to lose. The enemy knows he's been defeated. But do you? Do you? Do you have that confidence that no matter what the enemy puts in front of you, no matter how big the battle looks, God is with me. God is with me. And he will rescue me from anything. That's the kind of excitement that Gideon is stepping into. He finally stepped into the revelation that he was going to have victory over the Midianites through God. Judges 7, 15. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship before the Lord. Then he returned to the Israelite camp and he shouted, Get up, for the Lord has given us victory over the Midianite hordes. He divided the 300 men in three groups and gave each man a ram's horn and a clay jar with a torch in it. Then he said to them, Keep your eyes on me. He's actually stepping into what a leader looks like. Keep your eyes on me. Because I have a relationship with God and I know what he's doing. I see what he's doing and I'm going to do what he's doing. I hear what he's saying and I'm going to say what he's saying. Where are my mighty men of women of God at? That have that type of relationship that says, you know what? You're lost. You're confused. Look at me. Watch my life. Watch how I live. Watch what I say. Watch what I do. Watch what I don't do. Watch what I don't say. And follow me. Because if you're truly following Christ and he's the one leading you, the people that God calls you to lead, they'll ultimately be leading after Christ because you're behind him. He's leading you in all that you do. He's leading you in everything that you do. And we're, we're getting to the point of the story where it's about to figuratively and literally get lit. Everybody 30 below is kind of like, I think that's funny, ha <laughs> ha. Everyone above says, I don't know, get what he said. It's about to get good. <laughs> it's about to get good. <sighs> this is good. This is good. I'm getting excited. Watch out. Get antsy. Mm. Keep your eyes on me. I'm going to just paraphrase and just go off my heart if that's okay. Worship team, you can kind of start getting ready. We're about at that point. Imagine like being the 300 men. <laughs> You're giving us ram's horns, clay pots, and torches, the clay pot over it. There's thousands of them. <laughs> Gideon, keep your eye on me. Keep your eye on me. Keep focused on me. I know what the Lord wants to do. I know what he wants me to say. I believe that what we're about to see is a beautiful picture of what spiritual warfare can look like. The first part of the story is a ram's horn is being blown. A ram's horn being blown in the Bible signifies a war is about to begin. He divides his men up, groups of 100. They blow the ram's horn. They, they put out a new sound. And what do they do? They bust that clay pot, exposing what? The fire within. They break themselves 
and allow only the world to see the fire that's burning? What does it look like for us as sons and daughters to break ourselves out daily and the only thing the world gets to see is the fire of God? What happens when the enemy gazes upon the fire of the Lord? They retreat and they start to self-destruct. So what does it look like for us as believers to cultivate that real, intimate relationship with God that says, God, break my heart for what breaks yours on a daily basis and allow the fire of God to be so prevalent in my life that I don't need to be wondering, am I on fire today? Am I not? Am I good? Am I not? I'm just lit. All the time, 100%, Monday through Friday, 24-7, no matter what happens, that's all I am. And that comes out of cultivating a relationship with God. That comes out of having a prayer life, having a life that fasts, having a life that discerns the times, having a life that actually looks like a relationship with Jesus. That's the only way you're going to stay lit. It's not your pastor's job to keep your fire going. It's not your leader's job to, oh, it's my time of the week where I'm just going to encourage you all and me be your God. I love to encourage people. At the end of my life, I want people to say, he encouraged well. I felt like I could do anything. When I told Pastor Matt my dreams, he believed in me. That's, that's going to be me regardless. But if that's your relationship with God, that's a problem. It's a problem. I want to cultivate that relationship with God on a daily basis. I want to carry the fire of God in that way. I believe when the body of Christ steps into the fullness of this, this revelation all the enemy will be able to do is retreat and self-destruct. <laughs> That's how they overcame the army. <laughs> Whoa. They're killing each other. They're ki oh, did you see that? Did you? They're killing each other. They didn't have pots and fire and clay, pot, the ram's horns. They had weapons probably. They're killing each other. And all we get to do is confidently stand and be the light of the world. But you have to be on the battlefield. Because guess what? 22 scared sons are not on the battlefield watching this. 22,000 scared sons that don't know their sons are missing out on the opportunity to step foot on the battlefield. Yes, we're promised victory but you're called to be on the battlefield. Just because we promise victory doesn't say we just take, we're just gonna take an easy month off. I just, I just need a me month. Does your me month include God? Does your rest time include the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit challenging you? Man, read James. <laughs> Let the word of God convict you to the point where you're willing to break. Because you getting up every day and just saying, I'm the righteousness of, of Christ Jesus, but you live in ratchet, isn't enough. Isn't enough. It's not enough. You can know the truth, but you can allow it to not set you free. You can know the truth, but just knowing the truth is not applying the truth. It takes you waking up and saying, wow, my fire, it's, it's going out a little bit. It's not as, the flames aren't as kicking as it once was. And, and God goes, it's time to put on another log. It's time to stoke that thing. It's time to wake up. It's time to participate in your relationship with me. He's not gonna come and just douse gasoline on you every time you want a, you want a new touch because he comes and what he says is, yeah, I, I need you to destroy those altars you build out of rebellion. My heart is, I don't, I don't care if you've been here for 10 plus years or 10 days or whatever it is. All of us can say that prayer. God, search me. Search me, Lord. Search me. Is there any altars I've built that I don't even realize I built? Is there anything in me that doesn't look like you? The spirit of gossip needs to leave. The spirit of fear needs to leave. Anxiety, depression, it's not who you are. It's not who you are. But it takes you stepping into that reality to know that God is with you, that you can truly do all things. 
that if you're standing in front of a mirror and it's only you and the Lord, can you say, can you look in the mirror and say, I'm a mighty man of valor. I'm a mighty woman of God. That's who I am. So whenever God asks me to do something, that's the moment you've been equipped. The moment the Lord has come to you and says, this is what you're called to do, go. That's the moment you're equipped. You don't need another prophetic word. You don't need a prophet to come in and call you out and say, oh, there's someone here. and da, da, da. That happens, cool, but you don't need that. You need the word of the Lord. You need to know how to wield your sword. You need to know. You need to become that, that torch lit of flame. My question to you today is where are my warriors at? Okay, we got one. Where are my warriors at? Where are the ones that are going to refuse to live in fear, intimidation, refuse to live in compromise? We can't afford to not know where we stand on basic biblical principles. Premarital sex is not all right. Slandering people is not okay. Gossip is demonic. You partnering with the fear of man over the fear of God is demonic in nature. I'm, so, I'm, I'm, being, I'm excited. I'm sweating. My hands are cold. That's what happens. I don't know. I just say, God, use me. Speak through me. Just, let's just stand up because I asked the worship team. I want to go into a worship song, but I don't want it to just be this, okay, now we're at the time where I can, I can gather my things and no one will really notice me slip out the back. Well, I'm telling you right now, if you do, we're going to notice. Sorry. I'm putting you on blast because I care about you and I love you. And I want you to be a participant of this because I want you to be in the 300. I don't want you to be a part of the 22,000. Do you ask yourself before the Lord, just get real with God right now. Put your eyes on him right now. Ask the question, do I have altars in my life that need to come down? Have I lived a timid and fearful life? Have I cared about what more than what man thinks than what God thinks? Lukewarm is not an option. <laughs> we are promised victory, but I need you on that battlefield. Will you choose to carry the fire of God? to a dark world that desperately needs Jesus. As we start to worship this song, you can worship him from your seat. I'm not uber religious and say, yeah, it's only powerful if you come up front. But I tell you what, it is powerful for you to overcome that fear that you're petrified to come up here, that you're petrified to take a step forward because if you take a step forward, that's saying people know I'm not perfect. Guess what? You're not perfect. I'm here to look at everyone in the eye right now. You're not perfect. You're not perfect. You're not perfect. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. I need him every day. He perfects me. He molds me up. But the moment I take myself off the potter's wheel and say, I'm good, potter. I'm good. No, I'm going to start to fall flat on my face. So as we go into this song, worship. But if the Lord says, you know what? I want you to come to this altar prophetically to burn those altars that you know you have. I want you just to worship up front because I know that if you do, you're, that the fear of man's gonna break off. So let's just go into this song. Let's worship together and let's just see what God does. Is that okay? Amen.
it's all consuming, all consuming, all consuming. Thy your heart sees living flame of love. Come baptize us, come baptize us. there's a grace to just ask if there's anyone that just says man I need I need lit up I, I need the fire of God I felt I feel like I've lost the fire God's so patient and he's so kind that he will come and he will set you on fire he will set you on fire if that's you just start making your way to the front I just want to just want to say a special prayer and if you can't come up or whatever it may be just put your hand up just respond in some way. Just respond and say, Lord, that's me. I want that fire. Man, I want that fire of God that says, you know, whatever life looks like, I'm sold out. I'm all in. I want to be burning on fire for you, Jesus, every day of my life. So God, I thank you for a fresh baptism of fire, God, right now, God, that as we sit or we stand or we're here in this room, God, that we would sense and we would feel your presence like never before, God. That from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet, we would start to feel a tangible shift, a tangible shift happening. That you would burn away everything that's not of you. God, that you would burn away, God, all of those impurities, God. The purification process is not a comfortable process. It requires the flames of God. So it's between you and God right now. Just say, God, search me out. Search me out, God. Burn away everything that's not you. Burn away every selfish motive. Every opinionated thought that's not you, burn it away. Burn away all the lusts of the flesh that I've chosen to partner with out of rebellion. Let me be a torch set on fire for a dark world. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in this room, God. I thank you for burning away all the things that aren't you, God. That we would be a church set on fire for all the world to see. despite what's happening in our world. 
because you are good and you're worthy to be praised through every season, through every circumstance. saying that a new sound has to arise. A new sound that just as they blew that ram's horn, a sound was released into the atmosphere. So I'm going to ask right now, if you speak in tongues, I want you to release the Spirit of God into the atmosphere. And I really believe that if it's on your heart to speak in tongues, maybe you've been afraid of tongues, maybe you haven't understood tongues, speak. Let a sound come out of you right now in Jesus' name. I feel like there's people that are going to speak out in tongues for the first time. For the first time. You have to speak. You have to let it out. It's not going to be the supernatural, oh, I'm being taken over. No. Let that sound out. Let it out.
You are good and you are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be praised. Would you put a praise on your lips right now, God? I thank you that praise is our weapon of warfare. That praise is our weapon of warfare. God, I thank you for releasing a new sound that is going to come out no matter what is happening around us, no matter what the enemy tries to do to distract us, a new sound is arising in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you that you are preparing your church and you are saying that we are becoming battle ready. God, I thank you that you are saying we are becoming battle ready. So release that sound one more time to Jesus right now. God, we thank you for what you're doing in this place. experiencing your love knowing who we are participating in our relationship with you that we would feel confident to stand on the battlefield no matter what the enemy's doing God that you would encourage us by what the enemy's saying because <laughs> we win so God I thank you for your fire being poured out in your church like never before in Jesus name amen I love you guys excited for what God's doing. If you need special prayer for anything, make your way up front. A couple of the prayer team would come. We'd love to pray for you. And uh, we'll get ready for second service. Amen.